Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Progressive Bitcoiner. I'm your host, Trey Walsh, and today we have on the show Alex Gladstein. Now, Alex probably doesn't need an introduction to, to most of you listening, but for, for those that don't know of Alex and his work, he's the Chief Strategy Officer at the Human Rights Foundation and has, does a lot of work in promotion of Bitcoin, human rights issues, financial freedom, has a few books that out that we talk about that I'll link in the show notes as well, including his most recent one, Hidden Repression, that I encourage you all to check out and read. And we talk about all things Bitcoin and human rights, which is one of my favorite uh, issues to focus on, especially when talking to the left and progressives to dig into a little bit of how our world actually works uh, with our global financial system and how we can promote human rights and Bitcoin and why Bitcoin is so important to folks in these places where human rights uh, isn't as prevalent as we might experience in the United States or wherever you're um, listening in the West as well, and the importance of Bitcoin and things like that. We touch on some different FUD points from the left. We touch on Elizabeth Warren uh, wanting to talk about crypto payments and Hamas and things like this, and a lot of FUD-driven information, and try to get to the facts of what some of these um, issues are actually talking about. So it's a really great episode. I uh, really enjoy and appreciate Alex coming on the show uh, to talk about this as Alex is one of the uh, biggest um, inspirations for me early on in getting into Bitcoin in the first place. So please follow along with Alex and his work. And um, thanks everyone for, for jumping on. And we also did this as a live stream as well, which was really exciting. So appreciate everyone jumping on zap.stream, which we'll link that as well. So folks know to do that next time. All right, I'll let you get to the episode um, and please check out our promo links. You can check us out. Uh, check out our SAS mining links to get $50 off uh, the purchase of every miner that you purchase. All right, I'll let you get to the episode and we'll see you again next week. All right, Alex, welcome to the Progressive Bitcoiner. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Appreciate you coming on. And I think, um, you know, when we first connected a little while ago about you coming on, I think there's a host of things we can talk about and think about. And I have to acknowledge the world is just um, in a similar place, but a worse place and a chaotic place. Since we first reached out, there's so much that's been going on in the news in our world, obviously mm-hmm. with Israel and Palestine, with so many different human rights issues um, for, for us to touch on. And, and obviously I want to touch as well, have your, your book here uh, hidden, a little bit of a glare hidden repression, which is fantastic. I'm going to recommend and put that in the show notes for everyone, but, but just want to acknowledge that, um, it's just been a heavy, um, and hard time. I'm sure for, for you all at HRF, for you personally thinking about these things. Um, so, you know, appreciate you jumping on and having these conversations. And I'll also add, I'm not going to try to go into, you know, some horse historical explanation of a lot of these, these issues, but, you know, before we touch on some of this, I think many people listening uh, listening live and listening to the recording will know who you are, but do you want to just give a little bit of your background and who you are and what you do? Sure. So <clears throat> I work for the Human Rights Foundation, which is a nonprofit set up to help people who live under authoritarian societies around the world. It was created by a Venezuelan advocate. Our chairman is a Russian um, chess democracy uh, figure named Gary Kasparov uh, and the rest of our leadership comes from places like uh, Lebanon, uh, Guatemala, Mali, Hong Kong, uh, uh, truly a global perspective. And what unites us is the idea that people in certain societies have different ways to hold their government accountable and there's checks and balances on power and in other societies there's just very little of this. So we exist to try and help folks who are pushing towards uh, freedom uh, in, in, in places where it's very, very much at risk or where it's uh, very much, uh, let's say, held down. Um, just some examples are that in, let's say, more democratic societies, you know, you can make fun of your government and be paid for it. You can um, uh, expose government secrets, and in many, many cases, you know, live to talk about it. You can hold the government accountable for corruption. You can expose it and not worry about someone coming to black bag you most of the time. I mean, these are, these are pretty big differences to people who live under dictatorships where if they try to do this stuff, like, 
they'll get tortured, detained, I mean, poisoned. Mm -hmm. Their whole family could get killed or put sent to a camp of some kind. I mean, there's just, you know, there's just like a very different um, breakdown in society. And we exist to try and fill the gap and, and help people who live under, uh, you know, governments, political climates where they, they don't have very many um, uh, recourses. If they want to see the world differently, if they want to <laughs> see their government doing something differently. Um, you know, there's not a whole heck of a lot of ways for people in, in dictatorships to do that. So our programming exists to acknowledge that <clears throat> and then, and then, and then try to address that at the same time for about six years now, I've been writing and researching and, and talking about Bitcoin as a human rights tool, uh, based on what I've seen in the community of people struggling against authoritarianism. I, I've, mm. you know, seen it be a super effective tool. So I started getting more involved and interested in it. I've written three books that are uh, basically, you know, detailing and studying Bitcoin's role in the global financial system as it, as it goes from zero to something. Um, and I, I've been speaking and studying about the human impact that it has, the social impact it has around the world. So those are the, those are really the two main things I, I've been uh, keeping busy with recently. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things too, I don't know if I've heard specifically from you before on what, um, what made you go in this direction? Whether it's life direction, career dire dire direction, um, seems very much like a life uh, passion that devolved into a um, career as well. But what made you kind of start this journey and how long ago did, did that start? Yeah, well, it's a series of fortunate consequences as with most. Um, and that road was paved with um, big world events that I, I was confused by or... Um, wanted to know more about uh, originally the reason I decided to work in like the, you know, international relations, um, you know, world, let's say, um, was because of nine 11 and, and the Iraq war. I mean, that was crucible for me. I, uh, yeah. Lived right outside Manhattan as a kid. I saw that happen as a, uh, 15 year old kid growing up outside New York city. Um, mm. and then, you know, the following two years were just like this drumbeat towards invasion of Iraq. And, um, yeah, I was like a junior in high school when we, uh, invaded Iraq. Um, and I, I went to college the year, uh, of the, uh, 04 election. And I was in college during um, the surge and mm -hmm. everything that was happening there, 07, 08. And then I left college um, during the great financial crisis. So it's kind of a, you know, a lot of formative events. Fun there times. That, oh, yeah. That yeah. Um, just sort of made me think about things in a particular way. Um, but I got fortunate to, to in the middle of all that, get a, get a gig with the Human Rights Foundation. I've been there since 2007. Um, and I've been working on uh, producing events, doing research, working with activists directly all through that time, uh, learning about all different kinds of things an organization to do to, that could do to help people. I've been learning about how to work in the, with the media, uh, how to publish, how to write, how to edit, uh, how to fundraise how to do marketing. Um, so I worked in that area for a long time, getting very specific with a handful of our programs, namely our North Korea program, where we send information into North Korea uh, and our, our, our previous work in Cuba, doing something similar before the Cubans really got access to the internet. Um, so I saw firsthand like the, the, the impact that information and technology can have on people in closed societies. Um, and then later just spent a lot of time bringing people together and just, uh, trying to listen and learn and, and watch people cross pollinate ideas. I always thought that was really cool. So when I started to realize that Bitcoin was like part of the story after repeated exposures to it, going way back to ju meeting Julian Assange, seeing him post about, uh, Bitcoin a year later, um, 
seeing all kinds of activist groups start to use it, seeing all my friends tell me about it. And then finally, late 2016, early 2017, I was like, all right, fine. Like, uh, like we had been receiving donations in Bitcoin. I just decided to just be, be, be sort of serious about it, take a look at it carefully, dove into some Andreas Antonopoulos videos and books. Mm-hmm. And, and then I've just, you know, been on the adventure ever since, basically every single day uh, since around, you know, around then, just, just always wanting to learn more about yeah. Bitcoin and what it can do for people. Um, I think it comes from a place of uh, being a little jaded about the world um, and just kind of recognizing that, you know, maybe Bitcoin's this thing that, you know, can penetrate some of this inertia, mm-hmm. some of this um, sort of perpetual state of suffering and conflict that we see in many places in the world some of these iniquities, it's possible it doesn't work out. <clears throat> I thought long and hard about that as well. Uh, it could be um, a failure, uh, but it has this just absolutely tremendous promise. And it's currently a tool, a practical tool for millions of people where there's not a whole lot else they can hang their hat on. Um, so it gives me a lot of hope. I think that the general human spirit and just indomitable will of people. Uh, I've seen that change the world over the last hundred years. Like I've seen uh, people change the world through their books, through their political activities, through their software. Um, when whether whether it's someone like Elie Wiesel, who was on our International mm-hmm. Council uh, at the Human Rights Foundation, um, through his work, uh, people people learned about what happened to the Jews in Germany um, in a, in a big way. Uh, it was, yeah. it was like, I mean, I, as a kid had to read that yeah. in high school. A lot of, a lot of people yeah. in the U S read that as middle school, high school. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, or, or whether it's some of the activists we've worked with who were involved in these big peaceful revolutions in places like mm-hmm. the Philippines or Serbia, uh, or Satoshi him or herself, uh, you know, whoever they were, um, you know, creating this way for people to opt out of the financial system and participate in a peer to peer, um, you know, financial network is, it's pretty powerful. So seeing all this, mm-hmm. uh, it is inspiring, but man, yeah, it's, it's, it can get, can get intense, um, out there. Um, I see my role as trying to continue to do what I can to promote, uh, to help people understand how Bitcoin works as a, as a human rights tool. I think I've already, I've already seen enough <laughs> like mm-hmm. yeah, to justify yeah. working on it for my entire life. But I mean, <clears throat> there's so much more we can do every day. You know, I Mm -hmm. I continue to think that the big challenges these days are education and UX. I mean, you know, I think that if there was better education or more education or we, you know, (laughs) more Bitcoin podcasts, (laughs) but uh, uh, just, just more (laughs) exposure to these ideas. uh, You know, people, people can help themselves. I mean, it's a voluntary phenomenon, but I mean, I think we need more and more and more education better education, yeah. different kinds, different attempts, reaching different kinds of people. And then, and then UX, you know, that frankly, like, you know, the easier it is to use, you know, hopefully while preserving the things we care about in the community, mm-hmm. like self custody, privacy, you know, not making particular trade-offs, but the easier this thing is to use and the more education there is like Bitcoin will do the rest, uh, in many ways. Like I understand there's major issues now with, um, scaling constraints that there always has mm-hmm. been um, that, there, that will always be an issue as we move through in a, the adoption phase and we go from zero people using it to maybe a billion people using it mm-hmm. maybe more than that we're going to come up and we're going to pass along so many different engineering obstacles uh, limits bottlenecks and I, I think we're going to surpass them I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident that that we'll find ways to engineer a solution. Um, but even as it is today, it can help so many people. Uh, I mean, the people who, you know, can benefit from self custody and Bitcoin and learning how to use it as payroll device, as a place to store their money as a nonprofit or as an activist group, as a media outlet, learning how to do pay, pay again, do payroll with it, do, you know, pay employees with it, uh, make grants with it, receive grants with it. Uh, I mean, so much of the world can be onboarded this way it, in a way that, you know, it's not really impacting the like, you know, 
block space. Like <laughs> we're talking, you know, mm-hmm. in infrequent, you know, on-chain transactions um, that are not, again, your like daily retail purchases, but they're these really vital, important movements of funds that mm-hmm. come maybe once a month or maybe once a week or something like that. And, um, you know, the network can handle that right now. So yeah, I think we're a far away from taking advantage of what Bitcoin can, has to offer right now. I'm excited that people are out there tackling what it's going to be like in five, 10 years. And HRF is going to try and do its part to, to help with research in that area and to help support improvements. Um, mm-hmm. But I mean, by far and away, the most important area that, that, that we've seen is, uh, is, is, is in the area of, of education and, and UX. Yeah. Yeah, and you had mentioned just talking about uh, Bitcoin education, just getting the word more out there. And, you know, this theme of Bitcoin and human rights, you know, the more, um, you know, myself being in New England, uh, just people in the U.S., uh, obviously the target audience of this podcast are progressives, are the left, a huge faction in the United States and globally, who um, right now in large part are being fed a lot of different things about Bitcoin. Uh, that I would say are very inaccurate. So we want to do a lot of education for this population in general. I think there are a lot of positive tides turning on the environment in Bitcoin, Um, just Bitcoin becoming more mainstream and accessible and things like that, especially in the States. Um, When I talk to friends, um, just friends in my life who knew nothing about Bitcoin, any of the stuff, the most appealing thing to them has been the human rights angle. When I mention specific stories of how it's used, um, many of them have said, that makes it worth it enough for me to at least not want people to wish it didn't exist. Right. Um, so, so for you and your end, that's one of the things that I kind of grapple with is just how we can get out more stories about human rights, about um, like speaking with Farida on this podcast was just incredible and just such mm-hmm. an incredible voice for what that actually looks like. And it's not about, Oh, we love Bitcoin. Let's try to fit it into this human rights need. It's more like this, this need existed. This dictatorship existed. Bitcoin was the only way in this environment. Yeah. So that that need based thing is really really cool. So for me, I'm trying to just talk as much as possible about human rights in Bitcoin, um, and maybe a little bit less about number go up. Hey, that stuff is great. I think there's tons of resources for that if people are interested in that. Um, so mm-hmm. for you, just um, whatever folks still in your life may or may not know about Bitcoin, which it's probably few and fewer these days. Um, mm-hmm. How have those conversations been for you or recommendations on talking to people about Bitcoin and human rights in the face of such extreme yeah. FUD from the left, which I'll also touch on? Yeah, well, it's funny. Recently, I've been able to take advantage of the fact that a lot of people in Bitcoin are reading my stuff or following me to mm-hmm. hopefully you know, challenge them a little bit, educate them a little bit about stuff that's non-Bitcoin related. Yeah, that's true. That's been like really exciting and it's been an honor to, to have their, their ears, uh, for that. And that's basically the story of my new book is it's mostly not a Bitcoin book, but Mm -hmm. in the end, it's all about Bitcoin. (laughs) That's like, uh, kind of, kind of the story of a lot of this stuff. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think Bitcoiners are predisposed to want to learn more about an organization like the International Monetary Fund and what it does mm-hmm. because they know that money is at the inner workings of the world, whereas maybe the average person doesn't really realize the role money might play and they might look at the IMF and oh, it's some boring institution. Well, anything but. And, and I think the cool part about Bitcoin is, you know, once you go down the road of being a Bitcoiner, and I'm not just talking about like having some Bitcoin. I'm talking about mm-hmm. like pursuing, learning about why it was created, you know, yep. researching it, trying to figure out how it's going to change the world. Like once you go down that path, I think you're much more interested in asking big questions about finance, money, mon- monetary economics. Uh, it's, a, it's a really great teacher um, in, in that regard. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, aside from that, opportunity that I'm getting recently to talk about non-Bitcoin topics to Bitcoiners, which I think is really cool. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to do targeted education to people who express some interest, right? So 
we're working with uh, human rights movements, groups, opposition groups in different countries. I mean, these are people who face practical daily re- you know, challenges with regard to frozen bank accounts, inability to move funds, it, financial surveillance. I mean, these are just things they face all the time. So mm-hmm. when they learn about an escape, they learn about there's a technology that can help them avoid these things. They're very interested. Now, they may not yeah. know much. I mean, they may not know anything about the difference between Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. They may not, you know, they. I mean, it's, there's a long road. I mean, mm-hmm. they may not understand that it's not fully private, that it has uh, vulnerabilities in that area. They may not understand that anything about mining or any of that process. And, you know, some of this stuff they don't need to know. Some of it they do. I mean, it's just, it's, it's just a bit of a journey. Mm-hmm. Um, they may not know the difference between a self-custodial wallet. Custodial wallet, I mean, a lot of these people are really starting at square one, but at the same time, they're like, oh, wait, there's money that the government doesn't control. Please tell me more. So yeah. they're, they're really interested. So we're doing a lot of coordinated sessions where we work with some of the best Bitcoin educators, like BTC sessions and uh, Anita Posh, et cetera. And we're trying to support them so that they can go out and mint more Bitcoin educators mm-hmm. and train, basically train Bitcoin educators to then educate others. Yeah. So some of the stuff we've been doing with like the World Liberty Congress and other groups is like, you know, we come in, we help put together a course where 70 leaders from different countries learn about how to use Bitcoin. And then mm-hmm. they can then go talk to their movement, which could be tens of thousands of people or more. Right. That This is this sort of, it's grassroots, but it's also like hierarchical in a way. Like we're, we're, we're targeting the leaders of grassroots movements in, in places or situations where they might need Bitcoin. So that's kind of, our, that's like the strategic calculus of what uh, we're, we're doing right now with, with, yeah. with education. Like be, beyond, of course, like, yes, we'll make content and videos and talk at conferences, write books and articles and things. That's, that's I would say, public education. Mm-hmm. We'll do as much of that as we can, but but, you know, really the rubber hits the road with the, targeted education and it's it's brick by brick i mean it's literally person by person but i mean there's no other way to do bitcoin education uh, it, it requires in a way exposure to somebody who's going to talk to you and can answer your questions it, 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 mm-hmm. that's so tremendously helpful i mean the youtube videos are great and they're certainly way better than they were seven years ago or mm-hmm. whatever and the tools are so much better um but at the end of the day, it's nice to have like a live course, you know, where you can yeah, you can have someone answer all your dumb questions, which are all good questions. All Bitcoin right, questions right. are good questions. Yeah. Yeah. It makes <clears throat> you're obviously referring to like Anita's like crack the orange program, which she she just started recently. Um, she spoke about with with us and me premier Bitcoin and El Salvador is like a good example as well. Yeah. Just these grassroots um <laughs> programs that like they need funding. So, you know, people go out and, and donate to these, these type of causes as well, but just meet people where they're at in communities and doing it that way can't be overstated here. Correct. One other thing you mentioned too, <clears throat> before it, it, it loses me as you were talking about just how folks, you know, on the ground, um, especially if they're in harsh dictatorships or these different type of environments that you all are seeing or interacting with. Um, yeah, th- this episode, this is going to be probably a quicker turnaround uh, at the point of us talking now, it'll probably be a, a, a week from now. And there were some things that I wanted to bring up that were very relevant for, for, uh, recent news. And one of the things I think it was today, um, it, it's, I mean, it's been going on for a while with, um, my Senator here in Massachusetts, Elizabeth Warren, um, mentioning concerns around crypto and Hamas and funding of uh-huh. Hamas with crypto. And the reason I want to touch on this is because I think there are a lot of people that are outside of Bitcoin or maybe within that still are grappling, grappling with some of these things, but especially normal everyday people will see headlines like this and will say, oh my gosh, that's bad. Like we should, we should do something about this or, or we should go to ends to maybe well, why does crypto exist? We need to ban it in this way and that way. Um, and Senator Warren kind of pushing out these messages about crypto, but you even mentioned yourself how it's not necessarily private. There were different reports from months ago saying that, okay, the, the, the funds were actually seized and actually shut down in different ways depending on centralized platforms. So <clears throat> in terms of that kind of messaging and that kind of thought about 
a group like Hamas or a terrorist organization, again, the phrase utilizing crypto, what are, what are your thoughts there? Like if someone were to come to you and say like, Mm -hmm. oh, I've heard Hamas is using crypto. That's terrible. Um, what is a, what is a rebuttal? How do you, how do you address that? There's so many different ways to, to talk about that, but I, I felt myself being overwhelmed today and wanting to even post something on social media or like reach out to friends I knew that were like, Hey, I know you're seeing this, but like, let me tell you like what the other end of this looks like. Um, if we go to those extreme mm-hmm. ends, I mean, yeah. I think I'm always kind of worried about this. You said, you know, Bitcoin's not a guarantee, right? Um, am I worried tomorrow for this, some sort of um, cataclysmic event against Bitcoin and all these, these mm-hmm. freedom promoting qualities? No, but um, I am concerned and just bogged down with it and, and tired of it, to be honest. Yeah, well, it's certainly complicated. I think there's a couple things to unpack there. We have seen that technology innovations impact all social groups, right? So, for example, the printing press. It, you could argue it empowered the state because it accelerated their ability to propagandize the population. Mm. But at the same time, it allowed the merchant class the clergy it allowed non-state actors to get a little bit more of a level playing field. I mean, when we talk about the radio and television, it's sort of similar, right? You could argue that these like national broadcasts really put the people in the palm of their leaders' hands like no other technology had ever done before. Mm-hmm. If we go back a hundred years, we think about these like radio broadcasts that people would sit up and listen to. Tens of millions of people. Yeah. Uh, that wasn't necessarily <laughs> Something that like, uh, you know, you're like, you know, local reporter down the street had the ability to to do, mm-hmm. right? But at the same time, you saw the rise of, uh, you know, investigative uh, programs, uh, even on national radio stations like BBC, things like that. You started seeing competition in that area. But then eventually you saw the internet, right? And, and, and again, like the, these technologies impact all social groups. One could say ultimately the internet really empowered states because it has given them such an incredible ability to see what the people are doing. Um, mm. Not just tell the them the internet what to do. created the surveillance state. Well, yeah, one I mean, way to it, look at that. <laughs> it's it's not just that. Like, twist it previous that way, previous innovation revolutions in information that I just described: printing press, TV, radio. I mean, they gave the bil- they gave the ability to the state to tell people stuff, mm-hmm. but they didn't necessarily give the state the ability to tell this to, to inform the state of what the people were doing they still had to rely mm-hmm. on human networks for that largely right um the internet's a different beast i mean it's it's something that can help a government or corporations or corporations working with the government to geolocate people see what kind of information they're sending see what their habits are try to engineer their behavior all this stuff um so you know on the one hand, you could say it's 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 just sort of uh, history rhyming, but but I think the internet was a little different in a way in that it really did empower these non-state actors in in an even more kind of exponential way. I mean, a mm-hmm. aggressive way. I mean, if you think about the power that the internet has given the small person, I mean, may, maybe yeah. maybe net net, it's still like the state has benefited, but like man it really has empowered the small person. And mm-hmm. I think social media is, is similar. Like there's a lot of bad things I could say about Twitter. Yeah. Um, but man, it's been such a powerful tool for activists, mm-hmm. such a powerful tool. I mean, and most of them will tell you that and, and we could debate and, you know, to no end X or whatever, but like the idea of yeah. Twitter micro posting across a shared network with relatively little censorship, um, was pretty massive. I mean, mm-hmm. it, n- not that it led to some utopia, but that it just changed like the power dynamic. And then I think yeah. Bitcoin is like going to be even more like that, where it's, yes, it'll, it'll like strengthen certain entrenched powers, but like, man, it's going to be such a good, it's such a good tool for the little guy. Like it really mm-hmm. is. Yeah. So that's one piece of it. I, I, I think that it's not just this thing where like technology is agnostic, like, blah, blah, blah. I, I don't necessarily think that's true with Bitcoin. I really do think it's asymmetric. Like it, <laughs> It's it's almost like if you know maybe we skipped one 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 revolution which was encryption. So between the internet and Bitcoin, kind of have this encryption thing. And mm-hmm. 
Bitcoin's more like encryption, where like the big deal is not necessarily that Putin can send a secret message to his uh, daughter or whatever. The big deal is like tens of millions of Russians can communicate with each other without Putin spying on them, right? Yeah, yeah. Or, or same thing with America or insert the name of any government or power here, right. right? So so the asymmetric benefit of checking the power of the state or corporation is something you really see with encryption and with Bitcoin, I think. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, Bitcoin could be the most extreme example of that in as much as if it is widespread, like if it does become a bigger piece of the global economy, if it does one day become a reserve currency or some sort of backbone for trading uh, things like energy commodities. I mean, it's really going to, um, if it does one day start to replace government debt as an asset that states hold to save in, things like that. I mean, it, it, it really starts to limit like the ability of governments to do certain things. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, you know, part of me says that that's the trajectory we're on. And along the way, you know, Bitcoin's going to empower the little guy. And that means lots of little guys that we don't like, you know, like yeah. that's just the blatant reality of it. Um, that said, we're in an interesting technological moment, regulatory technological moment with Bitcoin right now, where like, it's not very good for large scale crime. Um, it is pretty amazing for small resistance, small doing stuff beyond government control, small crime, mm -hmm. if, if you want to put it that way. Uh, couple hundred, couple thousand bucks, you know, moving in and out of Bitcoin and fiat currency. I mean, man, that's going to be pretty hard to stop. Um, right. But like, you know, you look at a group like Hamas, which is basically essentially, I mean, a small state actor, I mean, on the small end, mm -hmm. but I mean, their budget is like, I, 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 I think it's like um, billion dollars a year or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm pretty sure that's accurate. Let's see. Yeah, that, that sounds about uh, right <clears throat> on par with what I've seen. Yeah, it looks like they're, yeah. Yeah, it's like somewhere between 600, 800 billion. I mean, it, it, yeah, I mean, it, it obviously fluctuates. Um, but somewhere between a half billion and a billion dollars. I mean, you know, that's pretty big budget. I mean, uh, you know, compare that to other small countries, right? Like that's, yeah. that's, that's significant. So, um, that's a operation where like small donations of a few hundred bucks is not going to make a difference or cut it, right? They're going to need an ability. If they want to use Bitcoin, they're going to need an ability to like um, somehow get, it, get their hands on it, first of all. So buy it with whatever resources they have. Mm -hmm. We know that they, they have very limited electricity. Uh, and it's not like they have any sort of like, like it, 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 let's put it this way. Mining seems improbable or, or very impractical right, right. given, given yeah, their resource yeah, yeah. constraints. Sure. I'm sure they could do a little bit of it, but like, man, they, they have other needs down there. So, um, mm -hmm. they're going to have to buy it. What the heck are they going to be exporting? So it's just, you know, the most likely scenario when you actually look at their budget is like a lot of it is, is, is basically what we would call financial aid from dictatorships. <laughs> right. Mm. It's like yeah, Iran yeah. or Qatar. And and they're just some of these are like quote unquote loans. Who knows? Some of them right. are just right, right, right. gifts, funds, whatever. But we're talking billions and billions of dollars over the last decade. Uh, yeah. you know, where it could make up 20, 30, 40, 50 percent of their annual budget is like basically just like support from mm -hmm. you know, whether it's Iran, or Qatar, uh, other Islamic terror groups around the world, et cetera. So, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, there's like, are they sending that in Bitcoin? Like, and then who's, once Hamas gets the Bitcoin, what are they doing with the, like, who's, who's buying Hamas's Bitcoin for stuff mm -hmm. or who's accepting? Do you see what I'm kind of getting at? Like, let's, yep, yep. like, you have to think, like, unpack this seriously. Like what, like the reason why Hamas is able to um, buy like a lot of weapons, things like that. I mean, it has a bank account in Qatar. Like, it's mm -hmm. just like, that's yeah. like, it's that the has, current financial like, system. Yeah. I mean, they have a bank account. Uh, yeah. I mean, this dude, uh, the leader of Hamas is out there in the Gulf, uh, living large, you know, mm -hmm. essentially, um, uh, connect, well connected, well funded. Um, yeah, they have bank accounts and stuff. So, I mean, you're talking about getting weapons in the hands of these, these people 
uh, you know, you're not probably not buying those weapons at the end of the day with gold or Bitcoin. I mean, that's, that's, yep. that's no. a stretch. Um, right now, I mean, could, could now Binance is a different story though. Right. So what I think has been accused is Binance helping Hamas. Now that I could see, right. Because then, right. Then Hamas is using Binance as a bank account and maybe some people are sending them Bitcoin and they're exchanging the Bitcoin into whatever it is, dollars, dirhams, euros, whatever, through their Gulf based bank accounts. Okay. Right. So, you know, is Binance a good tool for bad guys? Definitely. I mean, we've seen Binance be used. Uh, I, I, I mean, Binance leaked the, the identities of Russian activists to Putin. Um, mm -hmm. There's been all sorts of stuff. I mean, KYC exchanges are, are probably not going to be great actors here yeah. um, at the end of the day. So I don't, you know, no one, it's all a lot of like FUD here, but, you know, there are a bunch of stories. I've seen enough where I'm like, okay, the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, they know how to track Bitcoin pretty well, mm -hmm. about as well yeah. as anybody. Yeah. They're doing that. Uh, they are collaborating with ex KYC exchanges. Um, and Hamas, as you pointed out, came out and basically said that like hasn't been that effective because they know it can be tracked. So no. um, we'll see. I mean, I, I'm not sure how long this historical moment lasts where like, super large amounts of Bitcoin is sort of hard to do without KYC, like in, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, like I understand, yes, of course, there are a lot of, there's a lot of, um, you know, OTC stuff, like, but at the end of the day, like, like people making weapons aren't accepting Bitcoin today. So at right. some point you've got to get some sort of fiat currency along the way. Um, and that's just something that is the reality. And look, maybe it changes in 20 years. And that's a different conversation. Look, if, if like a nation state can go to like Boeing and buy a bunch of stuff, or if it, if it can go to the Iranian government and it can mm -hmm. buy a bunch of stuff in Bitcoin, and Bitcoin is like a widely accepted medium of exchange for that stuff. Okay, then we have a different, have a different story. And I think that story is the story of money. And if you believe in Bitcoin as something that's going to become money for the world, then yes, necessarily at the end of the day, everything's going to be done in Bitcoin or, or some sort of Bitcoin derivative, right. including all the bad stuff. But like, that's not, that's such a, that's such a sci-fi stretch right now. Like mm. the reality is we're living in a world where it's, it's good for small stuff. It's very bad for very large stuff. Um, yeah. which is the kind of stuff that dictators and groups like Hamas need. I mean, they, they need tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. And Bitcoin's not good at that. So that's another thing I would say. Um, but, you know, another thing I would say is that Bitcoin's going to be really good for the Palestinians, generally speaking. I mean, I think it's going to be a great tool for Palestinians, uh, all Palestinians. Uh, yeah. I, I think that you have a situation that most people are unaware of where Palestinians are forced to use the Israeli currency and banking system ultimately. And they're forced to basically be clients of the Israeli central bank. And obviously uh, a currency that, allows them to escape that is a resistance currency. I think that's really mm -hmm. clear. So we talk about peaceful resistance to the occupation. I mean, man, Bitcoin's a good tool for that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I did a lot of research in this area a couple of years ago. And man, it's not like I could do that research right now. People would jump down my throat. So yeah. <clears throat> sadly, <laughs> like I did the, in a way, I mean, it's so, so brutal to talk about it like this, but basically I did my Palestine research and all that stuff between wars. So not them, like, it's not like any, not, not a whole lot of people were paying attention. We'll put it to you that way. Right. To what <laughs> I was trying to say. Um, and, and that allowed me to reach like people who were interested in that particular topic. Right. Mm -hmm. Today, it's just like, it's unbelievable what's happening on, on this particular front out there yeah. uh, in, yeah. in society. And it, it, every, it, it, you know, it'd be impossible to have like a nuanced conversation about anything. Everything is so sort of, sort of polarized. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, I guess to recap, I think that ultimately, you know, we see Bitcoin empowering the individual over time. 
I think we see it empowering resistance movements, but I think it's pretty limited for groups like Hamas or, or large, large terror entities or, or dictatorships for now, because it remains pretty challenging to do business in Bitcoin um, mm -hmm. without, at the end of the day, some sort of uh, off-ramp to fiat. And, and I think at that point, you're back to square one. Yeah. Who's your fiat bank account, right? <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so yeah, I mean, that's not an easy answer. I mean, you know, it's, it's, a, it's definitely more difficult with, with, with Hamas. And that's why it's such an effective critic criticism mm -hmm. of Bitcoin. The dictator stuff is easier for me to rebut because Bitcoin's obviously bad for dictators. Like the CCP banned it, like mm -hmm. Putin prevented citizens from using it as a medium exchange. Like, yeah. Like Nigeria has tried to, cut off the banking system from Bitcoin. Like there's the IMF has tried to condition aid to Argentina's rulers on the idea that they limit Bitcoin. Like that, this is just so obvious um, mm -hmm. that the clearly a currency that the state doesn't control is bad for dictators. Um, yeah. Yeah. But terrorist groups. Yeah. That's, that's more complicated. Yeah. The, and the reason I ask this, cause you know, so many people I talk with and you included, it's like, yeah, you know, you hear a statement like that and we know like a million different reasons why that's just FUD and just what you explained. Yeah. But the problem is if we have other normies in the world, progressives, left folks that are trickling into the podcast slowly but surely, it's even just beginning to tell them, okay, crypto and Bitcoin are two different things. Bitcoin can be used for human rights in this way. It's, it's breaking down those, those basics, which I try to do here and there in, in these episodes, mm -hmm. um, just for, for that audience as well, because it is, that's how early we are. That, like, I, I think obviously it's only 14 well, years old. To I begin mean, with, but. I think a progressive, I, what is a progressive? Like, it's unclear. Like there's a lot of, I mean, what we're really talking about here is American progressives, right? Who yes. marry some kind of, um, you know, understanding that, state needs to be involved in the economy to prevent injustice with um some sort of critical understanding of u.s foreign policy at the end of the day that's that's really what it seems to sort of come down to and um i consider myself a progressive along those lines in in one way or another on both sides yeah. um so you would think that um I don't know. You 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 would you would think that this would resonate, um, especially when it comes to like support for resistance movements or peaceful protest movements or limits on warfare. Um, I don't know. I mean, we'll see. I mean, obviously, you're seeing a lot of growth in a in a small corner of the progressive mm -hmm. universe. Yeah, yeah. I, I would imagine the numbers are growing. But I, I just think it's such an amazing tool for this. I mean, especially when you hear someone like Farida talk about it. Uh, it's just like anti-imperial, yeah, anti-colonial. It's, um, it's anti-jingoistic. It's anti-forever war. It's anti-surveillance state. Mm -hmm. uh, it's anti-patriarchy. It's anti-misogynist. It's anti uh, settler, like I could go on and on, like, yeah. <laughs> like all that. I mean, it's, it's the dream of <laughs> it's, every, it's pro, I mean, you know, it's interesting, but it's also pro it's kind of what a great technology for unions and for workers. I mean, yeah. you talk about being able to preserve the fruit of your labor, uh, you know, in a way where if they're going to give you a demotion, they're going to have to give you a demotion, right? Where mm -hmm. like, like if they're going to pay you less, they're going to actually have to pay you. They're going to have to, they're going to have to come to you and say, we're paying you less. Normally, they right. don't have to say that. Mm -hmm. They just have to rely on inflation and pay the same. Right. Like normally they can, they can pocket a difference somewhere along the way by just not paying you more. But if we're on a Bitcoin type standard here, like they're going to have to literally pay you less. And I, yeah. I, I just feel like a lot of union labor people have not thought about that. Like wages are sticky. Like what are you, you going to do? Like yeah. pay people less? Like that's very... That's hard to do. Um, what's yeah. way easier is simply to not give them raises, 
Right. Hi, everyone. Hope you're enjoying the episode. Today's episode is brought to you by Bitbox. Now, Bitbox is a hardware wallet that's open source, incredibly secure and easy to use. And it's what I'm using to safely secure my Bitcoin in cold storage. Now, I know self-custodying Bitcoin can really be intimidating, but Bitbox is designed for ease of use without compromising on security. It's USB-C compatible and allows you to easily back up and restore your private keys with a micro SD card, which is really cool. Now you can purchase the BitBox using the promo code TPB at the link found in the show notes for 5% off your purchase. And I really want to thank BitBox for their support of the podcast. And I'm really excited about this new partnership. All right, I'll let you get back to the episode now. Do you ever feel like, uh, not in an egotistical way, but in a, just a, once you think about these things, okay, for human rights and then for labor mu- movements and then for the the 99% for the little guy for yeah small developing nations that have had to rely on the IMF and now maybe mm-hmm. they can kind of say f you at some point yeah. um when you think about all these things do you ever sometimes i do get very i i, I also feel that it's twofold i feel the doom and gloom sometimes of like what we could be as a society mm-hmm. as a globe as a world if we kind of you know, set aside some of these things in a way and just said, can we just agree that this seems pretty, pretty good, this thing. But other times I get really excited just thinking, oh, it's already, it's happening. It's going to happen. It's, it's this weird, um, two extremes that I, that I flipped be- between given the day. Yeah. No, I'm like pretty confident in Bitcoin because of the incentives. I mean, I, yeah. I think that we will need currency that can't be debased and that can't be deplatformed um, more than ever. Mm-hmm. And there's going to be a huge demand for that moving forward as there's more deplatforming and more debasement. I mean, that's really, at the end of the day, what it's all about. Bitcoin is the most debasement-proof, deplatform-proof technology we have. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. just yeah. like completely unstoppable in that regard. Um, I mean, you know, am I concerned about do I have concerns? Sure. I could, we could go, we could do an entire show just on, mm-hmm. am I concerned about concentration of Bitcoin in a few hands? Am I concerned about this, that, and the other? Of course I'm concerned, but like thing is, it's like, it's usually better with Bitcoin than, <laughs> than, than with the existing, uh, uh, way it's set up. Like, like take the ETF thing, for example, mm-hmm. like I understand that people are concerned about a small group of people controlling a lot of Bitcoin. Um, but people, people, it's like people forget we live in a relatively speaking in a land of laws and like that, that those funds are not like the funds of the custodians. I understand Mm -hmm. that custodian can come under a 6102 type attack. Yep. I get that. But generally speaking, that money in that pot is not the custodian's money. It's retail's money. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about pissing off if this does come to fruition and let's say there's 50 million Americans that have some sort of spot, Bitcoin ETF exposure, Mm -hmm. retirement portfolio, something like that. Yeah. What are you going to do? Fight against 50 million Americans who want their money back. Like that seems like a very poor thing for any corporation or government to try and do. So there's, there's little wrinkles that people skip over, um, that, that are, that are interesting, but certainly there's things to be concerned about. Um, you know, especially around KYC and, and like surveilling Bitcoin activity, um, certainly. Um, yeah. It's why it's so important to push these peer-to-peer markets where we do Bitcoin stuff without our without attaching our ID to the blockchain. I mean, that's ultimately, yeah. hey, that makes Bitcoin a privacy technology. Like you don't attach your ID to Bitcoin, it's, it's extremely good digital cash. Um, mm-hmm. As soon as you attach your ID to it, eh, it's not so great and requires right. a lot of work to, to undo that. I mean, that's a simple way mm-hmm. of looking at it. Um, but, you know, the tools are getting better. I mean, they're getting to the point where it's almost as good as basically like having an ATM and you can kind of, yeah, the government knows you've got some Bitcoin that you bought off Coinbase or whatever, Cash mm-hmm. App. But mm, you go through a couple coin joins. And, I mean, they know that you did a coin join, but they don't know where it's going from there. Yeah, It's yeah. pretty similar to like, they know that you received your payroll. And they know how much money you got in your Wells Fargo account. But then, but then they don't know what you did with it after you took it out of the ATM. They know mm-hmm. you used yep. an ATM. So you're going to have to answer their questions in court potentially. Well, what did you do with the money after? Mm-hmm. Well, maybe you're going to have to answer that question. I have no idea. What did you do with the Bitcoin after you coin joined it? Well, it's the same exact thing. What did you do with the cash after you withdrew it from the ATM? Like we're, we're getting to that point, which is, which is good. 
I think that's good. Yeah. So, so, so we'll see. But I'm I'm very bullish. I mean, just global Bitcoin adoption is just outstanding and just mm -hmm. staggering. Yeah. I mean, it really yeah. continues to just be so awesome. We just did an event in Nashville with Bitcoin Park um, with a hundred Bitcoiners from fifty five countries. It was so awesome and inspiring. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about huge educational Bitcoin movements that most people in the Bitcoin space have never even heard of before. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a project called Area Bitcoin down in Brazil that I don't think very many people like on traditional Bitcoin Twitter, crypto Twitter, I've even heard of because yeah. they don't really do a lot of English language. It's all in Portuguese, but mm -hmm. like they have 350,000 subscribers on YouTube. Like they're, oh, wow. they're just crushing it, <laughs> yeah. crushing it. So, I mean, and that's just the start of it. There's like a business school in the Philippines that's got like a whole Bitcoin initiative. There's, mm -hmm. you know, as you know, entire towns and cities in certain areas that have all kinds of Bitcoin legislation. There's an island off the coast of Honduras that, that has Bitcoin as legal tender. There's, mm -hmm. um, man, there's like big Bitcoin conferences happening, not crypto, Bitcoin conferences, not, not crypto yeah. conferences, but big, you know, sizable Bitcoin conferences, which would be significant for any sort of industry happening in Brazil, Indonesia, India, uh, Ghana this year, in the coming year. I mean, it's, it's extremely exciting. And I feel like the next cycles where a lot of these conferences go from 500 to 1,000 people it's mm. 20,000 people, right? And then you're building something really special. It's kind of yeah. like what you saw with the main Bitcoin conference in Miami, which which really is like a Western conference, certainly yeah. had a handful of people from abroad, but really more of an American, mostly American, somewhat European conference. I mean, yeah, they went from like 1,500 people to like 20,000 people in like two years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a yeah. pretty astonishing during, yeah. a, during a bull, right? So yeah. you never know what's going to happen with Bitcoin, but you know, it's, it's clearly a thing that has a fixed supply and the demand is variable. And one day mm -hmm. the demand is going to be a lot higher than it is now. And the price can be much higher. Right. So, yeah. so we don't know when that's going to be, but, but that, that, that's going to be, I think a pretty big game changer. So I'm, very excited about um, what we can do right now. You know, what's happening with Bitcoin adoption, what's happening with UX improvements, uh, what's happening with activist movements. Mm -hmm. It feels feels great. I mean, it's weird. It's like, I understand it's a sideways market, but it doesn't really feel like a bear market in that sense. Yeah, I would agree with that. I'm always learning about cool new stuff every day. Yeah. I mean, I, I think for me too, because I, I go on Nostr a lot. So then there's this whole little side ecosystem through Nostr that really blew up probably more January on of this year. So there's so yeah. many different things happening in the Bitcoin space that then also is, I mean, Nostr is still very much so, I would say this is an active user, a bit of a Bitcoin eco chamber. And so one of the goals is to try to expand it because it is its own separate censorship resistant yeah. technology well, and all of these things. I mean... It's kind of just like a censorship resistant discord for Bitcoiners. What's wrong with that? Yes. Like, so it's still amazing. cool. I, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But I think there's a lot of the devs that are like building really cool products that are like, no, this is transforming like marketplaces. Yeah. This is transforming well, I, streaming I, I, I what we're it, doing right now. Like, I think it'll grow slowly, yeah. but it, it, yeah. I mean, I, arguably it's really, it's been less than a year where it's been prime time. Really? I mean, less yeah. than like nine months. Okay. So yeah. I look at look at Twitter between like oh seven and the Arab Spring when it really started to pick up, right? Yeah, that's four. I just years. showed my wife so, that early. Um, it, it's been floating around the early video of like Jack Dorsey going over. These are my friends. I have like ninety friends, and just like talking about yeah. Twitter. I, it probably was from well, like that exact period. Yeah, let's um, see where it goes. Crazy. I, 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 let's see where it goes. I mean, I'm kind of. I mean, you kind of have to be waiting for the other shoe to drop, kind of, but. Yeah. It just keeps chipping away. It keeps being useful. Like I like posting there occasionally. I usually get really interesting feedback. I think it's cool to post different content there than on the other social media platforms. Mm -hmm. um, some people really figured out how to kind of build a community on it. And and now, you know, I'm not going to say it replaces what they have on, on Twitter or whatever, but, but it certainly gives them an outlet in case they get kicked off. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which, which I think is is something that Mastodon never really, never really did because there was a, a I can't remember what the trigger moment was, but there was some sort of Mastodon moment uh, 
well, maybe it was when Trump was kicked off Twitter. I can't remember, but this was like, <laughs> uh, probably. Yeah, it, it was, there, there was a moment where like tons of Bitcoiners went to Mastodon for like a month and it was cool, but like the UX was so bad. And at the end of the day, you realized it's just like a mini dictatorship of like the one person in that particular uh, federation, right? So it's yeah, like, yeah. I don't know, <laughs> like it's, it's certainly a check on power, but mm -hmm. I don't know. And then the whole blue sky thing, I mean, I, I was just going to mention blue sky. I've, yeah, I've tried, I, mean, I, I dipped in and out so much. Yeah. Well, you've got threads and blue sky and I, I, I just can't really see either of them working out. I mean, they're not, we'll see. I mean, I, I they, they both seem to want to have too much of the old thing. And I know that threads isn't even really, you know, they, they, they claim to want some sort of decentralized thing, but both of them have too much of the, the, the sort of authoritarian impulse of like wanting yeah. to censor or wanting that, you know, now look, if the user can, can choose, um, that's awesome. So that's kind of sort of the idea with Nostra, right? Is like, you can mm -hmm. choose what relays you're attached to. And yeah, ultimately, you know, that, that, that helps, but you know, there's a lot of like somebody else deciding things for you in these other ones. I, I yeah. thought the the demise of threads was particularly epic. Um, but I, and I guess some people still use it, but it's, <laughs> it's like, who knows? Uh, but currently it looks, it looks rough. Um, which just proves to you, shows you how hard it is to, to start something new. Um, but ultimately we'll see how these all things go. I mean, I don't, I think that Nostr may end up shining as like non-communications infrastructure, right? So there's mm -hmm. like a whole bunch of Bitcoin projects that are using Nostr as a, like, as a kind of a network platform or like as an infrastructure yeah. piece where it's not like you might be logging into Nostr to post something. It's, but it might be part of the back end to like a particular kind of feature of Bitcoin. So yeah, I think yeah. that's also pretty exciting. I mean, it's a back end of the streamer we're using right now. Like people can access this and not even know it's also utilizing Nostra Relay. Exactly. Like that, uh, if anyone's watching right now yeah. via the stream. Um, yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, just anything de decentralized censorship resistant tech. Yeah, it can't be overstated like how difficult it is, which is why it's so wild also that like Bitcoin is still here <laughs> and it's as dominant as it is uh, as an asset class, as a global tool. Um, it's such a... a a unicorn in so many ways, um, w which make it at this point, you know, too big to fail in so many different ways. Um, the incentives are incredible. I think the first thing that I saw, one, one of the early things that I saw about Bitcoin that really appealed to me, and I didn't really jump down the rabbit hole until early 2021, so still relatively new in the space in general, is you had posted it, but it, it's been around just the Trojan horse theory. Something about that just clicked for me because. Speaking to progressives mm -hmm. in the left, I, I try to have conversations saying, okay, let's talk about the environment or environmentalism. Like, stop expecting oil companies to just magically, oh, please stop using oil or please stop doing this, right? Like, people need to understand these incentives and these market incentives are real across the globe. Like, that, can we bet on something that incorporates that? Or should we bet on, let's say, please, let's ask nice because it's the right thing to do? with certain things. Typically change doesn't, doesn't happen that way. If there are a lot of political protests or in the case of Bitcoin, there are so many different incentives that incentivize greed that actually is good for the little guy or incentivizes, you know, even if you've had a lot of arguments against dictators, but if for some reason countries wanted to hoard Bitcoin or hold Bitcoin and this and that, you're not able to influence the network. You're not able to stop people from transacting in it yeah, well, in, in your country. You can, I mean, kind you of, can murder people, but you know, they had their chance yeah. a couple of years ago. Yeah. 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 When, when the network was smaller and more vulnerable and they, they didn't take a shot. I mean, I think that, but, and honestly, why should the Chinese government care what Bitcoin users do in America? Right. So they were just like, yeah. we want to add it here. It's not mm -hmm. harmonious. Yep. We want it out. Yep. Right. So look, if you're in a, if you're not in a rivalrous world, then Bitcoin doesn't work. Um, if if you don't have end game Bitcoin, if you don't have a competition of powers, then Bitcoin doesn't work because mm. you can consolidate control of infrastructure. Yeah. Um, but that's not our world. 
our world's a rivalrous world. Our world is a world that's fragmenting, that's deglobalizing. I mean, we have um, obviously a failed BRICS thing, but like we, we've got serious interest from Global South superpowers and from China and Russia and building their own stuff. Like they're not going anywhere. India's not going anywhere. Nigeria's not going anywhere. I mean, these countries are just going to get bigger and bigger. Yeah. More powerful in the future. Some of them, maybe, maybe we're at, some of my friends think we're at peak China. I, I'm not sure about that, but I, I, I certainly know we're not at peak India, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. You know, I've India, heard they have Brazil. the highest rate of, Bitcoin and crypto adoption, you've seen those statistics, it kind of gets glossed mm -hmm. over. So it's hard to say if it's actually crypto adoption or if it's actually is Bitcoin, but there's such a rise in, in Bitcoin and Bitcoin among women in India. And I've seen so many different yeah. stories. No, I just meant cool at things. the state level. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's yeah, say for the sure. US government tries to go after miners. Um, well, I mean, there's a bunch of other governments that are going to be happy to have the miners come there as, as, as and pay taxes and, and be, you know. Yeah. and be part of the ecosystem. And there's going to be governments that want to mine. And yeah. those governments aren't necessarily going to get along. And, you know, I don't think the incentives are there for, let's say we have this like nation state era of Bitcoin mining. Like, okay, and, and I'm not even necessarily sure that that's going to happen because I don't know if nation states are going to be very good at Bitcoin mining. Like mm -hmm. nation states generally tend to be pretty bad like when it comes to economic stuff. Like they tend to be yeah. pretty poor when they nationalize large technological industry. Mm -hmm. Usually, I mean, there are obviously some exceptions like the US state space program, but like generally right. speaking, you look around the world, like a lot of times, like there'll be a nationalization of something and it's like a fucking disaster. So yeah, um, sure, go ahead and nationalize all the mining in this particular state. Like it, we'll see what happens. Um, I think Bitcoin has interesting incentives there, but it's more that like, Let's say you had Chinese mining, American mining, and Indian mining or something like that. Mm. Like they're not gonna want to use the other state's pool. <laughs> like I'll tell you, I'll tell you right now. Like they're not like India's not gonna want to use America's pool, right? They're gonna want their own pool, right? So they're all gonna want their own pools. And mm -hmm. we're already seeing innovation, which is allowing the miners themselves to have more power versus the pools. So, you know, we'll see with Stratum V2 and, and things like that, but it, it it's it's less about the technology and it's more just about the straight incentives. Like it's mm -hmm. just in that world where there is like, let's say, you know, massive state Bitcoin adoption, which like I think most people have been considering as a possibility for but just since the earliest days of Bitcoin talk on, on, on the forums. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, again, that's, that's going to be a rivalrous world. And, uh, there's not just going to be one state that makes Bitcoin miners or one corporation. I mean, yep. there's different supply chains now. There's a, you, you know, um, near shoring, on shoring, de-risking. These are all huge things. So now you've got, in addition to the Chinese companies, you've got a bunch of different companies trying to make Bitcoin miners, including Block. Mm -hmm. I think you're going to start seeing um, a lot of action there in the next five years. So. I don't know. I mean, I, again, if the world was uh, homogenous and all agreed on everything, <laughs> then Bitcoin would, would be, it'd be hard for Bitcoin to survive. But it's precisely yeah. that the world is rivalrous and we have different powers and we're going to have conflict. That That's where Bitcoin thrives. It's money for enemies in the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or if governments didn't consistently go into debt and did things differently, <laughs> would the need for Bitcoin be as there'd still be a need for Bitcoin, but Oh yeah. Um, well, I mean, obviously things are not going to stopped abusing the currency and they stopped deplatforming people. Yeah. The desire for Bitcoin right. would be like very, very low. Now it would right. still so that's be, what we're betting funny, on. Yeah. But it's funny for Bitcoin. Cause like clearly that's a huge part of Bitcoin is, is mm -hmm. censorship, deplatforming and inflation. Clearly that's a huge attraction is that it's yep. resistant to these things, but that's just part of Bitcoin's story. Yeah. Yep. It, arguably in some ways, the bigger part of Bitcoin's story is that it's one neutral money for the internet that's not created by any one state. Um, so regardless of issues with inflation or um, censorship, which honestly, a couple billion people may be fine, may, may be insulated from those issues, mm -hmm. they still might want to make a payment instantly to India and they might right. be living in London or something. Like yeah. 
that there's just other things that are in Bitcoin's wheelhouse that are that, that you know it's funny like that yeah the biggest thing arguably seems like separation of money from state right that that, that seems like the, the the top of the mountain right there mm-hmm. but like at the end of the day there's all this other stuff that that that's very encouraging to see um i mean look it's it's a it's an asset based financial system it's not a credit based system i mean that alone is so interesting yeah uh and cer- certainly p- credit will be built Credit is built on Bitcoin already. It'll be continuing to be built on it. It's just it's harder to sustain a mountain of credit on top of Bitcoin than it is on top of fiat. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, with fiat, it's a claim on a claim. With Bitcoin, it's a claim on an asset, right? So you have like sort yeah. of a mismatch there, which ends up wrecking people. Um, but ultimately, at the base layer and with things like Lightning or, or a lot of the other uh, proposed similar like kind of L one and a half or L two type solutions. I mean, mm-hmm. these are all like this isn't paper Bitcoin. This is just different ways to use real Bitcoin, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so we'll see. So, but but the idea of having this like asset based global monetary network where you can pay for something on a different continent instantly online without needing any trust, like you don't need to trust that person because mm-hmm. it's not a credit based system. You don't need to do an ID a verification check on them. Because right. you're not worried about them like rugging you or whatever, because mm-hmm. it's a final settlement bearer asset. <laughs> like yeah. just yeah, that yeah. cannot be understated how huge that is, especially for like global commerce and trade. And that really, I mean, it's connected to, it cannot be separated from, but it's like a totally different feature set than the fact that it's got a, it's got digital scarcity and that it's, um, that, that it's essentially censorship resistant. Right. So yeah. there's all these different, features to it that that are that are to be explored right yeah for sure and what um what are what are my last thoughts here what what are you most excited for in terms of because a lot of your your focus i think with hrf in general and part of our focus too even though a huge part of our audience our main audience is us canada britain germany europe you know new zealand australia but a lot of our focus on why bitcoin is because of things that are happening in the global South because of human rights issues and those kind of things um, as appealing most to saying why, why Bitcoin, right? Cause like in the U S mm-hmm. we have PayPal, we have these things. We're fine. People are, people are fine. Right. And of course there's so many examples of why Bitcoin is great in the U S as well. But for you, when you think about your work, um, when you think about the global South, what are you most excited or hopeful for um, in, in terms of, of Bitcoin and just these communities living different lives than what they have been under through through stuff like your book and hidden repression and things like that. I think that the potential paradigm shift with the global financial system and its impact on the majority of the world's population is probably the thing I'm most excited about. Just the simple idea that Nations, you know, won't have to accumulate dollars to buy valuable things, mm. um, like to pay back debt or buy energy or whatever. That they could just harness local energy resources um, to do that, and and they can like permissionlessly mint the reserve currency. You know, as opposed to having to essentially negotiate with one particular country, one issuer, Mm -hmm. it's just so unfathomably huge. And it doesn't matter whether you think that the U.S. like conspired to to have the reserve currency or whether you believe that free markets dictated it and 100 times out of 100, it was going to happen this way. And, Mm -hmm. you know, petrodollars, a conspiracy and all that stuff. It doesn't matter what side you're on. Like the reality is it's dollar hegemonic world and yeah. that, that that does we can argue all day about why that's the case but the, at the end of the day it doesn't really matter that much i mean that's where we are and people suffer under that accordingly so this dream of having one currency instead of having 180 means that so much of the injustice in the world can be wiped away not i mean certainly not all of it but like the, the percentage of problems in the world that stem from the fact that there are all these different currencies and some countries can get squeezed while others benefit. Um, mm-hmm. and that level is, is just so deep and, and it's, yeah. it's just so second, third, fourth order. Like there's so many effects that come from that. 
um, and there's just so many restrictions and limitations that can be put on human behavior because of this fiat currency system and the way there's so many of these fiats. So if we can transcend this currency caste system, man, I just think that's the most bullish thing Bitcoin could do for humanity. Yeah, and I, I think and I hope we're, we're heading in that direction. Um, it's been really hopeful to see and, and really exciting. Um, I, Alex, I want to thank you for, for jumping on and doing this. I know you had a hectic sure. flight and stuff to, to do this. Um, thank <laughs> yeah, you for all the no work problem. you've done too. You know, you were, you were among a handful of folks that got me to look a little bit more into Bitcoin when my, you know, left American brain was like, ah, that's just crypto stuff. That's just for greedy <laughs> Wall Street. That's just for this and that. Yeah. And taking a second look. And then, um, you know, here I am having conversations like this and, and view it as something that really Great aligns with my values, wow. um, my nonprofit background, all of those things. So it's so glad it's it a could blast. Yeah. Pay it forward, man. Keep doing yeah, it. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll do. And I will say again, and we'll add it in the show notes. You've got a couple of books and probably more on the mm -hmm. way. Do you have any more on the way? Are you working on anything? Maybe we'll see. I just gave okay, a talk right. uh, called the currency cast system at the Swan mm -hmm. event. Um, which might be the basis for a new one. I don't know. I have to think about it, but it's cool. it's um it's out there so people can look at that talk if they're interested yeah lynn even when uh with our conversation with lynn she even was like at the end was like yeah i'm like probably writing another book or going to right now i'm like your what your giant <laughs> textbook just came out and she's like, yeah, yeah i want to talk about well, inflation though and i'm like okay um but awesome thank you so I much mean, for doing this do you want to do you want to direct anyone to Exactly, especially from folks like like her and yourself. Um, do you want to direct anyone to to your work? Where to find you on socials, things like that? Yeah, on Twitter or X, you can get me at Gladstein. Um, I am also uh, on Noster. I uh, I don't know. Given given the news, given what's in the news, I assume your audience is is, is interested in what's happening in the Middle East. Um, one of the chapters of my book. Checker financial privilege relates to Palestine and Bitcoin. So yeah, people might right. want to yeah. check that out. It's also available. A version of it is available as a standalone essay for free online called uh, Can Bitcoin Be Palestine's Currency of Resistance, I believe, or I guess maybe Currency of Freedom. So yeah. check that out. A lot of time and effort and energy and interviews went into that. So yeah. um, I remain pretty outside proud of, of it. it's, outside it's very of the uh not echo chambers, but outside of the current conversations about Palestine and Israel, which is so frustrating to yeah. I mean, try to, try I, mean to I was mainly through working this, through yeah. stuff that most people aren't talking about right now. Yeah, uh, like no one's talking about the banking system of, mm -hmm. of, of, of Palestine. Like that's just not in the conversation right now. So yeah, that's what I was basically saying is the fact that it wasn't wartime gave me the opportunity to go deep and be patient and work through stuff, and it's just be yeah. impossible to do right now because everybody's emotions are running so hot. Um. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I can only hope for the best for, for Israeli civilians, for Palestinian civilians. I hope that Israeli civilians can uh, vote out this insane government that they have. And I hope that they can, you know, put restrictions on what their government's doing. And I hope yeah. that the Palestinians have some kind of revolution uh, where they can get rid of Hamas. Um, so that that's what I would hope. But, you know, you know, it's... Hopes are hopes are just hopes. Um, but that, that that's yeah. certainly what I would like to see. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, thank you, Alex. Be well. Um, we'll, we'll be in touch. And um, thanks again for doing this. My pleasure. 